climate impacts are bigger, the private ability to adapt is smaller, and the public response is smaller, low-income populations are going to be much, much more effective, and I would argue already are. Welcome to Vox Dev Talks. My name is Tim Phillips. Now, between September and November in 2023, the Bureau for Research and Economic Analysis of Development, you might know it as BREAD, and the International Growth Centre are offering a virtual PhD course on environmental economics. Vox Dev Talks is going to be bringing you interviews with many of the economists who are giving the lectures starting, well, right now. Robin Burgess of the London School of Economics is also a director of the IGC and Kelsey Jack of UC Santa Barbara have been giving introductory lectures and they join me now. Robin, welcome to Vox Dev Talks. Thank you. And Kelsey, welcome as well. Hello, Tim. Robin, first of all, this comes at the end of LSE Environment Week. Can you tell me what that is? Also, what your impression of it was? Basically, LSE Environment Week came out of a, an initiative started by me and some PhD students. It's kind of grown into 40 academic talks, mm-hmm. four master lectures and three public events. And I guess what it is is just a whole bunch of people coming to the LSC to talk about how to apply economics to environmental issues, which covers not just academics, but also policymakers. So a bunch of conversations and lectures and people starting projects and thinking about how we address some of these big issues that we're all facing. Kelsey, thinking about addressing these big issues, is climate change going to have different consequences for the global poor compared to those of us who live in high-income countries? I think almost certainly. I think there are three big reasons why low-income populations are likely to be more affected than high-income populations. The first is just where they're located in space. So if you look at a global map of income levels, for example, the poorer regions tend to be in places that are already hotter, already more water scarce. And so climate change is likely to worsen conditions that make people happy, make land productive, etc. The other two major things are one, you can think of kind of the adaptation to climate change as coming through a combination of private responses and public responses. And where incomes are low, the private responses are going to be less for the same reason that low income households and individuals consume less of almost everything. They just have a tighter budget constraint. And so their ability to spend money on adapting to a climate shock is just constrained by the budget that they have. But the second thing is they're going to tend to live in cities or counties or provinces that are also budget constrained, that are also more limited in their ability to fund public adaptation responses. So the kinds of things that might help mitigate, for example, a drought, a flood, crop failures, things like that. If the public entity, the public government typically, has fewer resources, then those public responses are going to be less as well. And so the combination of these things, the climate impacts are bigger, the private ability to adapt is smaller, and the public response is smaller, means unfortunately those all work in the same direction and suggest that low-income populations are going to be much, much more effective, and I would argue already are. Does that mean, Kelsey, that when we're doing research on this and thinking about policy for this, we have to define a distinct economics of the environment for low-income countries? Well, it depends on on what you mean. I think the the first answer is no, Mm -hmm. that studying the economics of many things, uh, it's about the applications and thinking carefully about the context in which our theories and models are being applied. I would say, though, that there are several things that potentially look distinct, some that are coming out of what is the economic context and what are some of the new issues that we might have minimized when studying the environment in richer contexts that become important when we move to poorer contexts. And then the second is that I think there are certain features about the environment itself 
which are distinct. And so if you're coming at this more from the perspective of this wasn't your question, but more from the perspective <laughs> of how might development economics have to look different when studying the environment, I think there's some important things there as well. But on the first, I think that the first difference between richer and poorer places applying environmental economics is just levels, right? Mm -hmm. So if air quality is much, much, much worse in Delhi than in New York City, that the types of damages that we need to study, the types of consequences that are worth measuring may just look quite different. The second is related to that is that the cost structure of policy, for example, might look different. And some of that, again, is just levels, but it also may be different in kind. It may be that, for example, if you need to set up the EPA to have your first environmental regulation, then the challenges associated with environmental regulation look very different than if you're in a mature environmental bureaucracy and you're just thinking about the increment of changing some rule that's already on the books or adding a new rule on top of many that already exist. So I think that's quite distinct. There are also challenges in many cases with state capacity, with implementation. So even in places where an environmental bureaucracy already exists, making sure that the rules that are on the books are actually getting implemented effectively fairly can be a particular challenge in low-income settings where state capacity may be a little bit more limited. The final feature where I think there may be some important differences to keep in mind is, you know, this is a little bit in the weeds, but a lot of the core tools of environmental economics rely on valuing things that are outside of a market context. So environmental yeah. economics is really built on market failures. So for example, you know, public goods and externalities, that is the bread and butter of, of environmental economics, which means that market prices don't really deliver a signal of the value of, for example, clean air. Now, the methods that environmental economists have long used are things like a hedonic property method. What you do in a hedonic property method is you look around at housing prices and you figure out how much more are consumers willing to pay for a house that is in a slightly cleaner place than a house that looks very, very, very similar, but has a little bit worse air quality around it. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a major, there are many major assumptions uh, running through this. Yeah. There are many that are common to rich mm -hmm. places and poor places. Yeah. I think there's one that, that really stands out that might hold in, again, New York City, but perhaps not in Delhi or even more so in rural India, which is that property market have to work well. Yeah. Right. And so if land transactions, if property transactions, if there are major frictions involved in those, that's taking off the table a major, major methodology that environmental economists have long relied on. And so that's a particular example, but there are quite a few places I would argue where some of the market frictions that are particular to low and middle income settings that maybe there's some frictions in high income settings too, but they're much, much, much smaller, that that changes some of the business of doing environmental economics. Just quickly to flag, I think the other thing is that, you know, like any effort by economists to study things that have kind of important natural science underpinnings, mm -hmm. we have to be somewhat careful because some of our stylized models of the world, when we start to apply them to ecosystems, systems to climate change and other things like that, we have to worry a little bit more about tipping points, nonlinearities, you know, other things that make the model a little bit messier. So that's just a plug for saying, let's take the science seriously as well as we embark on this. Robin, you highlighted at the beginning of your lecture that confronting climate change is one enormous problem. It has to be done at the same time as we make every effort to eliminate extreme poverty. Are these in the short term compatible or is there inevitably a trade-off here? The way I think about it is the thing that's important is human welfare. And that's been the traditional focus of all of economics, and particularly in places where there's lots of poor people. That was a sort of big thing for the last 20 years or more, 30 years really now, and brought so many people into the field of development economics. And so the way I think about climate change is that in many ways it's a headwind against that because Kelsey was saying there's, there's stuff happening which is pushing people's welfare down or making it more difficult to do their work or whatever it is that's the underlying mechanism. So I think the way I think about it is always with that focus on human welfare, what is it we can do to simultaneously confront climate change and raise welfare? And I think that the answer to that, which is really not very clear is we need to do things which are 
innovative in many different areas. It could be innovations in social protection. It could be innovations in how we treat the natural environment and lessen pollution environment. Or it could be clean energy. I think one thing to keep in mind, we can't push mitigation off the table because if we were to do so, the whole planet would continuously warm. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that means that the innovation that makes things cleaner, cleaner growth, cleaner energy, and so on, has to diffuse through our middle-income countries at quite a rapid pace, as well as doing things to protect people who are already being damaged. So the quick answer is, yeah, there's certainly trade-offs, but I think that increasingly we're becoming more hopeful that we can find a path through to clean energy and clean growth, which, as you can tell by the names, <laughs> sort of suggest some sort of jointly achieving poverty reduction and confronting climate change. But I think the picture is not crystal clear at all how you do that, and it varies wildly from country to country. So I increasingly don't really see a division between, obviously there's divisions by income, but the set of issues in different countries, even within the EU or across different parts of the US, are vastly different. Robin, is there a lot of space to be able to do new research in this area? It sounds like it from what you're saying. I've always been a little bit skeptical about stuff that's been pushed by places like the World Bank and outside bodies, because who knows what <laughs> they want in Malawi or India. Mm -hmm. But I was surprised in Environment Week, which didn't just have people from across Africa and South Asia. And it had people like Heather Boucher, who's a key person in the Council of Economic Advisors for Biden on the, the Inflation Reduction Act. And what was interesting is that everyone was pretty much saying that we have to do stuff quickly and we're all on the same page on that, but we don't quite know what that stuff is and we don't quite know how to finance that stuff. There's a lot of hope that some of it doesn't require finance, that stuff will just spread because it's cheaper or whatever. So I think it was very reassuring that across the board there was a genuine movement now kind of environmental movement, which is widely held. It's not just Extinction Rebellion. It's moved basically into the mainstream of economics, and it's moved into the mainstream of economic policy. So I think that's a hopeful thing, because it means that whether you're a business or a government or an NGO or academia, you are trying to figure out things that your organization can help with. My kids feel much more strongly about this than older people of my family, but it's still even now being felt right across the age gradient. So Robin, you split uh, the areas of interest into three categories, which are adaptation, talking about natural capital, talking about clean energy as well. So I'd like to talk about those three. First of all, on adaptation, Kelsey, you did some work on the effect on water supply of climate change. Why does that have some effects on inequality? What's interesting in the case of water, at least in a lot of urban settings, is that the response to climate-induced shocks is mediated through a public utility, mm. right? So if the if households are consuming water that's being supplied by a public utility, then how households feel that shock is going to be at least in part mediated by how the utility responds to that shock. Mm -hmm. And arguably, there's a very similar story at work when you think about electricity. So I talked about a drought and a, and a water crisis that happened in Cape Town, South Africa a few years ago. But we're seeing sort of similar things play out in even rich country power grids where rolling blackouts during heat waves are causing households to seek substitutes. And so really what this particular story is about is about the availability of substitutes, which is how people are adapting to a public utility being less able to reliably supply at stable prices these mm -hmm. goods that people really depend on, which in this case are, are water and energy. And so the reason that the response is, is unequal is a two-step story. The first is that different households will have differential access to those substitutes. So in the case that we were looking at, it was access to drilling for groundwater. There are two reasons for this. One is that if rich households are using a lot more water, then 
the private benefit of investing in alternative water supply is just much higher. Mm. But then you compound that with the fact that these households are also perhaps, you know, have more cash on hand, they have more access to credit. And so if it costs a few thousand dollars to sink a well, then it's really only the people who can afford that upfront cost who are going to be able to do it. Now, once you substitute toward something like groundwater, or if we continue the electricity analogy, rooftop solar, for example, Mm -hmm. then the marginal cost that the household incurs in many cases is very, very low right, of consuming that alternative source of supply. So once they've made that fixed investment to gain access to that alternative to the publicly supplied water or electricity, then they can consume at a much lower price. Yet the grid, you know, the water pipes, the electricity lines still need to be maintained and paid for. And so what happens is a lot of those costs of maintenance and and the fixed costs of running these public systems to supply water and electricity get shifted onto the lower households. Mm -hmm. So the rich households now have this very low cost alternative that they can substitute toward at least some of the time, maybe not for everything, maybe not for drinking water, you know, maybe not at night for solar, but they can shift toward at least part of the time, which is effectively very close to free for them. Whereas the lower income households that have not been able to invest in this alternative supply are still stuck paying whatever the utilities prices are all the time. And in many cases, those prices will go up as you lead customers off of the network toward these alternative supplies. There's I think a lot more work to be done on this. This is an area that people have have started to study. And one really interesting distinction, and I think related to some of what Robin talked about in the introductory lecture, is the role of technology in driving some of this. So we're studying uh, wells, which are an ancient technology, but in the rooftop solar case, really the substitute is quite new. And so Mm -hmm. it used to be that these natural monopolies that were the public utilities really could adjust prices and count on people to have pretty inelastic demand. But as technology creates substitutes, that model may really start to break down, which is kind of bad news as the variability of things like temperature or water supply increases with climate change. Robin, this sounds like it's probably typical of adaptation initiatives at the moment in the absence of policy or subsidies. Is that the case? Yeah, I mean, I think what Kelsey's saying is absolutely right, that there's Mm. sort of two bits of this. One is that there's a whole bunch of things, for example, in the energy sector, where people either don't have access to energy or there's a lot of blackouts or which get worse with climate change. And hence, they look for substitutes, and those substitutes used to be super dirty, like diesel generation. Yeah. But now there's some cleaner stuff, which is coming along. So that's one area that there's some innovations in energy and water and other things where, where you can move to something more dependable. But I think the other bit, which I guess we know less about, is is there going to be innovation in policy? Are we going to do stuff differently, say, in the social protection space? Because mm. the type of risk we're facing is totally different. I mean, it's a much more catastrophic type of risk for many people. So you get a big aggregate shock and everybody is. You can't do the sort of sharing with the household or the village or the barrio or whatever. So I think there do need some very new ideas, which I think will be centered, a lot of it will be centered around both getting people out of jobs, which are very risky, like subsistence agriculture, because you're being hit all the time by these shops, and also thinking about insurance and reinsurance and how do you deal with risk across space, whether it's sort of across different bits of Bangladesh or you're dealing with different parts of the world, because these shops are happening in different places. And I felt during Environment Week that that was really surging up Mm. because the fundamental thing is that a lot of these shocks, they, you know, people would be experiencing these shocks had it not been for a bunch of emissions happening from the Industrial Revolution onwards. And so then you say, okay, climate justice, whatever. But then what are you going to, even if you did get some money, what would you actually spend that money on? I think that's a really unknown but really important area which we need to kind of provide evidence on in the hope that there will be some money coming. But even if you're raising money domestically, it seems to me that the marginal dollar now in the adaptation space is probably in a, quite a different spot than it used to be in when you were just confronting poverty. Another dimension of this that you both focused on is natural capital. Robin, how do we define natural capital? How do we measure it, I suppose, as well? 
I mean, that's a great question in the sense that, and I, and I guess the simplest answer, I'm not sure I know myself, but uh, <laughs> I mean, the, the, uh, the one way to think about it is that there's something there which is valuable, and it, it may not be something that's being valued in the market even, like, for example, having a forest in, a, in an area which is important for a watershed. So you don't want to chop it all down because then all the erosion will seep into the rivers and to the lakes and so on. But I guess one simple way to think about it is there is some value in a forest. Some of it can be that. You can sell the timber, for example. You can excavate the minerals beneath the forest and sell those. You can turn that forest into a parking lot, and that's going to be valuable. But there's some bits of that you can't or find it much more difficult to value. Like there's like orangutans running around in the forest, and you know they have some sense, and we don't really know how to value that. Or there's a bunch of insects running around. So I think there's biodiversity valuations much trickier. But one thing that really struck me during environment, we had the main advisor to the New Zambian president, and she was saying, listen, you know, we get all this stuff about conservation and natural capital and we have beautiful forests and game parks and all this stuff but you know she's what we really want to know is what's the option value of holding this place as a forest or as a as a game park and that benefit would accrue for example in the case of carbon not just to the citizens of zambia it would accrue to the citizens of the world and she said when we set up zambia after independence the first president, she claims, put all the national parks where all the minerals were. <laughs> so <laughs> not only are you not cutting down the forest, but you're also foregoing all that revenue from, from taking out the cobalt and the copper and all these wonderful things that go into EVs. Mm -hmm. So she said, isn't it possible then to think about what that option value is? And if you want to conserve it, you know, let's figure out a way of paying for that, because the benefits there are not just for the citizens of Zambia. I mean, I've heard of it's all for the continuation value of taking out, for example, taking down a forest and then allowing mining, which could be quite considerable. And it's obviously incredibly attractive for countries which are in the process of growing out of poverty. I was just going to highlight the kind of added twist to the demand for minerals point, of course, is that the rise of renewables is really fueling a lot of this increase in, in demand for minerals that many of which, you know, not exclusively, but many of which can be found in uh, low income settings, potentially underneath forests. So some of these trade-offs, I think, are actually extremely stark and very, very interesting in terms of the potential trade-offs. But if we don't know how to, for example, think about the value of that forest, then as Robin's highlighting, that doesn't feel like a trade-off at all. And yet we may be getting it wrong. Kelsey, you presented research on what seems at first look like a really classic problem of externalities, the sort of thing that you learn in first year undergraduate. You were talking about how farmers in India burn their crop residue and that causes pollution. So therefore, you put in place various measures to remove that external effect. But it wasn't working. Why not? There are a couple of different interesting explanations here. So you're right that the decision by farmers in India to burn the residue that's left behind after they harvest their fields is sort of this very, very classic externality problem mm -hmm. for the farmers. It's certainly the cheapest and fastest thing to use this very, very ancient technology of fire to get the stubble off their fields. But there are very, very substantial external costs associated with that, both in terms of local air quality and in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Mm -hmm. Now, the Indian government has several policies that are on the books, including fines, but these are really not enforced. And so that means it continues to be a, a cheap alternative or option for farmers. So what we wanted to do is think about the fact that, you know, typically these farmers are not particularly wealthy. And so it might be an attractive policy alternative to think about subsidizing their costs of seeking out alternatives. But rather than identifying what alternative they should use to preserve the flexibility of their choice by just placing a payment on the good behavior. The challenge with these kinds of conditional payments, and I would argue that similar challenges might arise in the case, for example, of Zambia conserving its forests or, or other international transfers as well, which is that they're twofold. One is there's a timing issue. 
Mm-hmm. You're typically asking someone, an actor, whether it's a, a farmer or a country, to forego something that has immediate benefits in exchange for some promised payment that comes in the future. Mm-hmm. And so if the need for, if there's a cost to doing that activity, or if there's just important foregone income from that activity that needs to you know, be incurred today, and the payment doesn't arrive until tomorrow, that timing particularly for low-income farmers or credit-constrained countries, that timing may mean that it's actually not feasible to comply, even if the payment is sufficient to cover those costs. The other issue is trust, right? And so, you know, Zambia would have to trust that Norway is going to honor its payment promise. The farmers in our case had to trust that these payments were actually going to arrive if they undertook this costly activity. And so what we tried to do is think about these constraints and actually innovate in the contract design by offering part of the payment upfront. We still wanted to keep some of the payment conditional on the good behavior to maintain the incentive properties of this type of an approach. But by offering some of the payment upfront that did that address both of these issues, one, it meant that farmers had some cash on hand at the time that they needed to seek out an alternative to burning their fields. And then second, it provides a costly signal of the trustworthiness of the contract. Why would some principal who's going to renege on the final payment bother to offer some kind of an upfront payment? And so both of these constraints were alleviated. There's a paper, we do some work to try to untangle which of them is really driving things. But I think in a lot of settings, both of them are likely to be important. And I think it's really important as we increasingly with policy are looking to these carrot-based approaches instead of stick-based approaches, that these sequencing challenges will continue to come up because you typically you always put the carrot in front of the horse so that it follows the carrot, but it has to be reliable and it has to be that the actions can be undertaken before that payment actually made. So finally, I just want to talk a little bit about clean energy. Robin, policies to divest from fossil fuels, as you say, solar panels rather than diesel generators, they're going to be hugely important. Are those technologies mature enough now to be adopted in these contexts if policy made it possible, attractive to do so? I think the short answer is yes. The reason for that is that they've become a lot cheaper and at least for the off-grid stuff, super easy to use. Mm -hmm. So I think the challenge is now is very connected to what Kelsey was describing, which is utilities. How do you integrate renewables into distribution of energy via the grid? And that's a thorny issue in <laughs> many yes. countries because a lot of people don't pay for the electricity, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're in a loss-making business, the incentives to invest in a solar park or whatever is, is much more limited. So basically, there's a disconnect, is one way to put it, that if you look at countries where the grid is reasonably operated, like China, the diffusion is happening rather quickly. And I've been doing some work with John Van Rien and others about what we're driving the growth of innovation in China. It looks like a lot of the kind of standard instruments you were referring to, such as subsidies and so on, have been super important. But the disconnect basically comes at the point of export of that solar panel into country X. And what happens then and what incentives are there to adopt solar or wind or hydro into the energy system? There's a lot of barriers, regulatory pricing that we haven't figured out. And we haven't really got either the same group of companies that we had with generation Mm -hmm. and indeed with all the fossil fuel oil companies, which are super well run, can operate in any country. So those sorts of firms are sort of emerging but they haven't fully taken hold. I think one thing that has been beneficial has been the Ukraine war and the enormous rise in the price of fossil fuels, which has then driven pretty much every country I go to. That's the main complaint is that the the fossil stuff is way more expensive. And it also feels very insecure because sometimes you can't even get hold of the gas or whatever it is you're looking for. It just doesn't feel like we've got the right policy tools to make the fusion happen super quickly. Mm -hmm. That is where we are. China, which of course is a huge part of emissions and itself as a middle-income country, has made huge strides. But even there, because demand for energy is so upward sloping, they're just sort of adding coal and solar and wind or whatever they can get their hands on. 
I'd note also that you're the author, one of the authors of a, a new IGC white paper on innovation, growth and the environment. Considering that the rewards are so great, but as you say, the obstacles to overcome are so great as well, is it possible for low middle income countries to become leaders in innovation in clean energy or will they always be customers of innovation? I mean, I think in many areas of innovation which are going to help us confront climate change, whether that's waste management, whether that's finding new ways of doing agriculture, water management, there's certainly lots of scope for any country, whether it's low or middle or high income, to, to contribute. For technologies that require a lot of R&D, such as solar and wind, I think many countries like India can aspire to become global leaders in this. And same with Pakistan, Bangladesh. It's more difficult for low-income countries to have that research capacity. But I think where they can be leaders is in basically moving quickly so that they leapfrog much of the transition through a bunch of fossil energy. And that can be very attractive because you get a lot of co-benefits from moving to clean energy, which they're currently suffering the most from, for example, air pollution. The damages bit of this is just striking in terms mm. of where, where damages are greatest from, for example, air and water pollution. Very, very striking that they're concentrated in the areas where people are the poorest. We shouldn't sort of just limit ourselves to energy. There's all sorts of innovations going on. And how do you make water safe to drink, uh, you know, which is not always the most complex technologies, which can also move rather quickly through countries and change people's lives. Thank you both very much for introducing us to these topics. We'll be talking in the next couple of months to many of the authors that you've referenced today who have been giving lectures, and uh, we'll hear what they have to say when we go into more detail on some of the individual topics. But for now, we've run out of time. Robin, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tim. And Kelsey as well. Thank you, Tim. If you want to know more about the course, register for it or download slides and the reading lists, then go along to the IGC's website, which is theigc.org, and it's easy to find all the information there. This has been a Vox Dev Talk. The best way to make sure you don't miss an episode is subscribe to us. You'll find us wherever you get your podcasts. All our past episodes, some featuring Kelsey and Robin, as ever, are at voxdev.org, where you'll also find articles about the papers we feature.